In this episode, I discuss the three main reasons why I dislike using retirement programs to build wealth. I'm Nate. I make sense out of money. This is Dollars and Nonsense. If you follow the herd, you will be slaughtered. Retirement programs. What a fun topic, right? You know, at the top of this podcast, I also wanted to mention, you know, some news in my life. We just uh, are announcing now the birth of our fourth baby boy, our fourth son. We have no girls. We have four baby boys. And uh, he was born last week as of today. And this is my first day. I came into the office today to shoot this podcast episode. That's how much (laughs) this podcast means to me. I haven't been back in uh, since he was born. I'm coming in just to shoot this episode. And uh, here I am talking about retirement programs. Of course, you have to know that I must be a finance guy, and I must really believe uh, if you follow the herd, you will be slaughtered as our mantra, because I'm sitting here hanging out with a newborn baby, enjoying my family, and I'm going to take a little venture out from that world just to go talk about how much I dislike retirement programs. (laughs) So that's what's been on my mind. That's what I wanted to discuss today, of course. Um, And man, I am thankful to have found the infinite banking concept 11 years ago that I that I came in under Ray Poteet's tutelage to learn this concept because it has uh, revealed some things to me uh, about money. And of course, I'm just philosophically bought into IBC in a lot of ways. It, it is the true gateway drug to financial independence. It's the gateway drug to doing things differently with money. So many people run into infinite banking, they start learning about these policies, and they realize there are other ways to build money than what we've been taught. And that's going to be what I discussed today with the three main reasons why I dislike retirement programs. And I also wanted to say that these are going to be three reasons why I dislike retirement programs. I honestly don't mind in any way if I have clients that are learning about IBC and want to participate, and they still are going to be putting money and leaving money in retirement programs. That's perfectly acceptable. In fact, you'll you'll go through this uh, the next, you know, these three main reasons why I choose personally not to do them. And you may agree or disagree with them. In fact, I'm going to give a whole bunch of caveats as I go along in these three main reasons that if you're not in the same wavelength as me, maybe they actually are for you. So that's why I wanted to preface this. These are the three reasons why I dislike retirement programs. I've never put any money in retirement programs. I never plan on putting any money in retirement programs for many reasons. Um, and, and this is going to be a few of them. In fact, we've done this episode topic before. We've done many topics on retirement programs. So many of you listeners would probably understand and realize that we don't like them from, from all of the episodes in the past. But it's, it, I, you know, my understanding in the financial world grows as time goes on and I have more things to say about certain topics. And maybe we haven't hit some of these topics in a couple of years you know, doing a podcast as long as we have. So hopefully no one's getting bored of it. But let's go ahead and dive in. There's three reasons that I've been thinking about lately. These are why I dislike retirement programs and why I'm not jealous of everyone who's involved. Why I think the grass is greener where I'm at in the world of alternative investing, private investing, partnerships, entrepreneurship, and infinite banking. This is, this is I think, the sweet spot financially. And everyone else kind of has it uh, in a very bland way, in a way that's not going to help them achieve any sort of significance. And so the three main uh, reasons are, number one, it kills creativity. The second one is that it breeds uncertainty. And the last one, the third one, is that it produces insignificant rates of return. Let's go ahead and dive into each one and spend a little bit of time in each one. Uh, Number one, that it kills creativity. Having never been involved with retirement programs, I like to say, believe that I've been kind of put at some sort of buffer. There's a buffer between me and, and the world. But I meet with almost every client that I've ever met with, of course, has been involved with retirement programs in one way or another. It'd be It's a rarity that someone comes to the IBC table and has never been involved with them. And what I'm so thankful that I haven't been involved with is that I believe that re- the, the biggest flaw for retirement programs in general and the mentality they breed is that it, it kills creativity. Um, for the vast majority of people, they get caught up in this W-2 job and they're stuffing money in 401ks, IRAs. They're doing all of the, the, the regular, you know, herd based mentality things with money and they don't add, they, there's no space for them to produce any value in the world that they're saving money. It, it, there's no creativity. There's no impact. They personally have zero impact on whether it works out or not. Zero. It's just a set it and forget it and leave it and never touch it and never use it. And there is absolutely no creativity. I do not meet with people 
who have been successful financially because they put a whole bunch of money in retirement programs. Anyone that I've met with that's been truly financially successful has involved some level of creativity in their world. They've done unique things financially. A lot of times, of course, this means they've started a business, by the way. I mean, that's fundamentally, they got into the world of entrepreneurship in some fashion, and that starts to breed a lot of, um, you know, financial significance and success in the world of entrepreneurship. I've, I've always believed this, and, I, and I'll preach it to the day that I die, that if you want to make a true impact financially that will last for generations, you've got to add some entrepreneurial spirit to to your financial position, no matter what. Whether or not you want to go start a brand new business from scratch and run it, that'd be awesome. That's great. I mean, that's the tried and true way to build true you know, financial significance. But if you don't do it that route, you at least should be involving some sort of entrepreneurial spirit some, in, uh, in how you build wealth. And so um, with, with this, essentially, people are going to get average results and it, you, just get, you just go towards the mean. So whenever you, when you go into retirement programs, it's just an average way to do things. And there's absolutely no creativity involved in it. That's why I've talked about in the past, the idea of barbell investing. In fact, you should go back and listen to some of the episodes I've done recently on on how to build an empire versus retirement planning strategies and so forth to understand what I mean by barbell investing, which is essentially the vast majority of highly successful opportunities that you'll run into involve your input to leverage an opportunity that can become extremely significant and life-changing if you get involved in it. What I'm trying to bring up is no one has ever made life-changing moves inside of their mutual funds in retirement programs. It doesn't happen. They're not meant for that. They are meant to produce average results for average people, which is why I believe, once again, that IBC is the gateway drug out of this um, type of thinking, that, is, that once you realize there is another way to build wealth, that I don't have to lock my money up, that's not caught up in the whims of the market, that I can use whenever I want to at all times with no taxation or penalty or fee or anything, and, and, I, and it can still produce for me great rates of return down into the, into the future, you start to unlock some level of creativity that used to be sitting dormant, people didn't even know they had, where they will start doing things with money they never would have dreamed they could have done without um, going down the IBC world. So number one, the first reason why I don't like retirement programs is that it kills creativity. With a caveat to this, which is that you need to know yourself. Whenever someone comes and asks me, Nate, should I continue putting money in retirement programs? I cannot answer that objectively for anyone else. It is all about who you are and what you want to accomplish. Fundamentally, that's all that matters. And so whenever you meet with some people who are very passive uh, financially and they like that, in fact, they don't even really want to get involved with money. You know, I've got plenty of clients that way. They love IBC, but they don't plan on investing in anything. They just want to, you know, fund policies, re- achieve the rates of return of policies, and have complete control over their money to send their kids to college, to buy cars, to pay off their mortgage someday, to get out of debt. And they're just doing the basic life things with policies, and they don't they don't want to add any creativity. So even the people in the IBC world, it doesn't it doesn't require you to go out and, and find investments and become more entrepreneurial, but, I, but it does stir you to that. And there's no question it stirs you to that, that opportunities come knocking at your door whenever you have available capital and you start to have an eye for things and there's no way around it. But I'm saying it's not, not required. So whenever you are looking at your own life, if you are mainly more of a passive person, it may very well be that retirement programs are for you in a lot of ways. Like you do just want to set it and forget it. You don't want to be um, in charge of any sort of decision financially. That's perfectly fine. So the first thing is that it kills creativity. The second one is that it breeds uncertainty. Retirement programs breed uncertainty. They're, from start to finish, people who put their faith and trust in retirement programs are always actually uncertain of many things about what's going to end up happening to them. (laughs) So it's actually not good emotionally. Many people, it's kind of a stressful emotional roller coaster living in the market. There's two main areas that retirement programs breed uncertainty. Number one is that the vast majority of retirement programs involve um, the stock market in some way, most of the time through mutual funds or ETFs or something like that. But most of the time, it's a mutual fund investment inside of uh, a retirement program, which of course produces this feeling of uncertainty then of course we don't we have no idea by the time you get to retirement what it's going to do in there 
You have no clue what's going to happen. Market goes up, market goes down. You have no control over. You can't impact the result of anything that's going on inside of it. So it breeds, there's market uncertainties, which we're going to talk about, that, that we're all familiar with. And there's also tax uncertainty with a lot of um, retirement programs, of course. There's tax uncertainty. So the market uncertainty really starts to impact people when they're setting money aside for retirement, they're getting closer to the retirement age, but they spend a lot of their time emotionally connected to the balance of the retirement programs of which they have no control over. And they're very concerned whether or not they're going to have enough money to end up retiring. Even in retirement, even when they're actually retired, they don't know for sure how long their money is going to last because everybody is fully understanding that there is no there is no certainty in the world of retirement planning. So because of the uncertainty, you do not know how much money you need in any way. You, there's just too much uncertainty. And I guess I could have added this to the list of why I don't like retirement programs. I don't like the idea of retirement to begin with because I think it breeds a ton of uncertainty and it causes problems emotionally. And everyone's just scared. Very few people retire in a way that is fulfilling and there's a very little, there's low level of retirement confidence um, overall. And I just don't think it's healthy for people. I mean, in the name is the objective. And if the objective is not ideal, then using the, the tool to, to achieve a uh, non-ideal objective, just the whole thing's kind of a crapshoot. I just don't enjoy much of the discussion around retirement programs at all. But because of the market uncertainty, they just breed some emotional concerns. Most of the time, people will scrimp and save, and they really don't know how much money they can spend, so they spend their retirement years really cutting way back. They retire to enjoy life, and then suddenly they are stuck, you know, really trying to scrimp and save every little thing they can because there's no real cash flow being produced from retirement programs that they can live off of. They have to sell their assets normally in retirement programs. Most of the time you're selling your you're selling stocks, you're selling mutual funds, you're liquidating the account to produce income. Anytime you have to liquidate something to produce income, it's not actually producing income in a very good way. It's very unstable. It's based on market valuations at the time. So everyone understands there's market uncertainty there, which you don't have to have with certain other uh, types of investments. Uh, there's not There's not as much... Uh, just built in uncertainty of what's actually going to happen and whether or not you'll be successful. You could do everything right, per se. You could save money. You could just fund max fund retirement. You could do everything right, and it could still not work out that well for you. That's a big, that's a big uh, issue. The next thing is the tax uncertainty invo- inv- involved in retirement programs. A lot of people don't even give much thought to this. The tax uncertainty is a big deal, though. In most retirement programs, especially like your, your default 401ks, IRAs, this is not including the Roths per se, but mainly your, your more traditional retirement programs, IRAs and 401ks, where uh, you, said you contribute money and it's called, they're tax deferred. And so essentially what that means, and I think a lot of people are confused by this, and I've talked about this many times on the podcast, you do not actually save money on taxes by putting money in retirement programs. That is a myth. That's not true. You, there's no tax savings involved in retirement programs. There is tax deferral in retirement programs, which offers some benefit uh, compared to no tax savings and no tax deferral at all, just like your basic you know, brokerage account style investments uh, where you don't get a tax, just to put money in, and you have to pay capital gains tax on the back end. But on the flip side, it's just not actually tax savings. And so whenever you go to pull the money out, you have to pay income tax on whatever the tax rates are at the time. So whatever tax bracket you fall under, in, re- in the quote unquote retirement or whenever it comes to distribute the money, that's, I mean, you have to pay whatever the tax bracket is at that time. And so a lot of times you'll find people, max funding 401ks and IRAs, and they don't know how much of the money is theirs and how much of the money is Uncle Sam's because we're dealing in this uncertain future uh, where taxes can change at the drop of a hat. It depends on who's in the office, who's in control of Congress, who's the president at the time, wh- what's going to happen to tax rates. And in fact, if you're the more and more successful as time goes on, which happens to most people, you may not ever be in lower tax brackets down the road. In fact, it shouldn't even really be a goal for, for most people to be, end up being in a lower tax bracket down the road. This is one of the things that surprised me. Like You can go look at someone who has a million dollars in their retirement program. They think they have a million dollars. It feels like they have a million dollars. But everyone knows they don't have a million dollars. They have a certain percentage of a million dollars. They they know what they have if they use current tax brackets. Like, okay, I'm in the, the 30% tax bracket. So I, I approximately have like $700,000 in my retirement program, net, net of tax or whatever it's going to be. Uh, but we don't know if it's going to be 40% by the time they actually start pulling it out. For, we don't know anything about what the future tax is. So there's just uncertainty across the board. And I wanted to kind of push back on the taxation because I think a big draw for some people 
they feel like I, I need to be putting money into my retirement programs because of the tax savings. And I'm just he here to say that's, that's essentially a myth. Even if you are going to be in a lower tax bracket down the road, I just think it, it, it benefits you to have less and less uncertainty. The more certainty you can add to your financial life, the better you'll feel. And that's, that's what it's all about. <laughs> in a world of uncertainty, no one has objective advice. So how you feel is actually a predominant thing. It, you should do things that make you feel good. You should avoid things that make you feel bad. Uh, I know that some people don't like that. Some people want objectivity in financially, but it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in a world of un uncertain futures that you don't control. You don't control tax rates in the future. So might as well pay the tax today that you know the rate and so and put in something that you're not going to have to pay tax in the future. That way you can check one box, say, okay, my tax uncertainty is no longer there. I can feel good again. Because who knows? Are you tired of feeling like everyone has their hand in your pocket? At Living Wealth, we believe in challenging the status quo. After all, most of those conventional tools only seem to make someone else rich. Let us show you how to take back control by banking on yourself. Visit livingwealth.com slash escape the bank. You'll receive instant access to what we call the beginner's course. This free, in-depth, easy-to-follow course teaches people how to create and profit from infinite banking. We not only discuss the philosophy and principles behind infinite banking, but also offer real life examples to demonstrate how it works. Even folks experienced with infinite banking often tell us they learned a ton too. So it's worthwhile regardless of your experience level. Stop letting banks and Wall Street dictate your financial future. Again, that's livingwealth.com slash escape the bank to gain access to the free course today. Now back to Nate and Holly. So it kills creativity, retirement programs number one, kills creativity, it breeds uncertainty, and lastly, it produces insignificant rates of return. This is a fundamental one as well for, of why I don't put money in there. You know, some people are uh, concerned about the rate of return that a policy will provide. And they'll say, well, Nate, can I make a higher rate of return in the stock market or this or that or whatever it is? And of course, this goes back to this. This wasn't even about IBC, by the way, this podcast episode. It wasn't meant to be about infinite banking, using policies to achieve, you know, becoming our banker strategy. But I'm, I'm just bringing it up to say that I think it's possible that the stock market gets better uh, publicity than it deserves in a lot of ways. <laughs> I don't believe it. I think they, it produces insignificant rates of return over time especially in the environment we live in right now. There's more global competition uh, than ever before. Like the United States heyday of the 90s and the dot-com, you know, the, the, the birth of the internet and digital business was huge. We've had an amazing run. I, I, I'm not alone in believing that the United States run as just the, the only place for high-quality business is not going to be here for forever. And let's and we may end up starting to see rates of return that are more, uh, you know, similar to the way the world is going to be working, like in Europe and other civilized, you know, first world style countries. Mainly, I guess mainly in Europe. But you would notice that a lot of them, or even in in Japan, things like that, where their market's not is not doing that great, especially compared to the U.S. And so, all I'm trying to bring up is that I believe it produces insignificant rates of return. It has been producing insignificant rates of return overall on average for a good amount of time now. And I don't think that's going to change. I think that if you get your hands on your money and start producing real value in the world through some more alternative non-market-based instruments, especially things that you can impact the end result, you're going to blow it out of the water and you just use IBC, the Infinite Banking Concept, and the policies as your springboard, as your launching pad to achieving those greater, more significant, more fulfilling investment opportunities that do exist for those who are looking and interested to add creativity and to go find them. I was uh, running some numbers, and since the year 2000, so this millennia, from 2000 to the end of 2022, the Dow Jones Industrial Index has produced an average return of 5.7%, 5.7% over the last 20 years. The S&P 500 without dividends, so just the, the, the index itself, has produced 5.9% since the year 2000. So in this millennia, the last 22 years, it's averaged 5.9%. Uh, the S and P 500 with dividends, with dividends included, is like 7.8 percent. But still, what I'm trying to bring up is these are not significant rates of return to be in love with, to be infatuated with, to leave all of your money there and have it be the foundation for your life. That it is not 
inc- it's not incredible for the amount of uncertainty that exists. Because one of the big uh, market uncertainties that I forgot to mention in the second point was that mainly th- there's this there's this uncertainty called the sequence of re- of return. That in fact. Averages are okay to talk about in some way. I mean, we've done episodes about the difference between actual rates of return and average rates of return. I don't have a lot of time to dive into that, but just to suffice it to say for really quick, the idea is this. Anytime a, uh, an investment can go down in value and up in value, the average rate of return goes out the window. It actually, we need to start referring to the actual rate of return of something. What I'm trying to get at here is that the actual rates of return are fundamentally what what really matters and it becomes more and more obvious in the sequence of return. So if you start losing a lot of money early on in retirement and if you retire during a recession, which of course you don't control, then your chances of actually outliving your money go dramatically up. I mean, a huge chance that you're going to run out of money if you have to retire in a bad economic environment. So the sequence of return risk is huge. And that's what I'm trying to bring up. And whenever in point number three, that it produces insignificant rates of return is that if you look at the past, you know, this millennia, (laughs) There's been a lot of uncertainty, a lot more, um, you know, recessionary. There's been, there's just been a whole bunch of things that have occurred to where the market's just not doing that good. The idea that you can earn a 12% average rate of return like Dave Ramsey preaches is just out the window. It's just not happening anymore. Uh, and then you couple that with the fact that there's in every retirement program, especially in a 401k world, there's pretty heavy fees involved, a lot of them under the table, that are going to produce a headwind for your results. Uh, and then on top of that, the vast majority of mutual funds don't even meet the the market average over a long period of time. In fact, there's almost none of them meet the market average over a long period of time. So you look at the average investor and they're probably making five, six percent after fees most of the time over long periods of time. My dad was in the market from 1992 to, tw- to 2012 and he his, his return was like four percent over that 20 year period. I'm just saying the average person in retirement programs is not making a very good return over time. Maybe they'll have a great year where they make 30%. They're like, wow, this is great. Then they'll lose 20%. And then they'll make 10%. And then they'll lose 5%. And then they'll make 5 or 10 And And I'm just saying they're inching their way forward in an insignificant way. I am not that tempted to be involved. The only time I would ever want to get involved with the market is after a recession. Like, in other words, if the market drops by 30 or 40 percent, we have another 2008, 2009 event where we, where everyone loses a ton of money. That would be a good time to jump in and just make a quick buck before you jump out. I'm totally fine with doing that. But just, it does not produce a high enough rate of return to take the uncertainty, the market uncertainty, the tax uncertainty, the locking up money. So I can't use any sort of creativity essentially while, you know, while it's in there. Um, and just the rate of return in general is not that great. After you take into account all of this, I mean, the policies themselves that, that we use with high cash value policies are actually very competitive, just in an overall just comparison over the last 22 years or so. After fees and uh, different costs are involved, there's just not a, there's not a big draw for me. I know that I can do far better if I get my own hands on my own money with far less uncertainty, far more control over the end result, and much higher potential. Um and so I'm just not that enticed to do retirement program investing. So the three reasons why Nate Scott, myself, does not dive into retirement programs is that it, it typically kills creativity, locks money up, and any money that is locked up in something that can't be touched or that there's walls and fees to pay to touch it is just a bad place to build wealth if you actually want to get your hands on it. So it kills creativity, it breeds uncertainty because of the market and the tax uncertainty involved with it, and it does not produce a very good rate of return. It, it's not significant. It does not draw me in in any way. to to For the risk involved in it, it does not seem like the reward is really what I'd be interested in doing. It produces insignificant rates of return overall. Um and those are the three reasons why I choose not to be involved in retirement programs. I am not you. You are your own person. You choose to get involved with them if you want. But these are the three main reasons why I personally do not. And of course, I've done many episodes in the past that have also talked about this before in, in different angles. There's many different things involved in this. Not just these three, but these are the three big ones on my mind right now. Whew, well, that was fun. I'm going to get back to my baby. Uh, I'm enjoying some time spending with my wife and my new baby and my other youngest that I'm, you know, <laughs> in charge of right now as my wife is nursing and, you know, taking care of this newborn. So it's been a pleasure to join you for this episode, though. If you guys are enjoying this episode, if you want to push forward the movement that we're trying to preach and, and promote, if you love infinite banking and want the world to know about it and you think that this is a great show that can get the word out there, if you guys would uh, mind 
right, you know, rating, reviewing, subscribing, all of those fun things. It just helps the algorithm say, yeah, this content's good. People are enjoying it. We appreciate all of you so much. Thanks for joining us. This has been Dollars and Nonsense. If you follow the herd, you will be slaughtered. For free transcripts and resources, please visit livingwealth.com slash E206. Listener, one last thing before you go. Start your journey towards financial security and wealth today. Visit livingwealth.com slash escape the bank. Upon completing this course, you'll have all the information that you'll need to see if infinite banking is right for you. Again, go to livingwealth.com dot com slash escape the bank.